Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Rick and Danny Show. We have a special treat and guest for you today, but before I kind of introduce him, Danny, I think you've been uh, sweating over there and want to say something to me. Got another dad joke for you, Rick? Another um, one, really? Another okay, one. Let me, lay it on me. Um, it's a good one, so sit tight. You make me nervous, Rick. You're making me nervous. <laughs> I have, like that, you, I have that effect on you, people. It's like you have word vomit and you just can't stop when he's staring at I you. know. <laughs> he, he, he actually does make me nervous. Don't look at me. Um, so what do you call a Frenchman wearing flip-flops? I don't know. They call him Philippe Flop. <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> Come on, that was good. No. <laughs> that was so no, good. That's, that's that like was one of his Brennan, better Brennan's ones. Not the best. Yes. Brenna's like, the best judgment of, of my dad. She's jokes. like your supportive mom. She is. She's, she is. She'll I tell like you her. every joke is good no I matter what her. you say. And you're the disappointed dad always. Always the disappointed dad. Always. Yeah, no. I'm a little, a little hurt he didn't laugh at that one. I, I thought, thought it was, it was good. good. It was I liked good. it. Thank good you. job. Thank you. That means you know when I do laugh. But he did laugh at a previous joke I told. One. Or one in the future. We don't know. Well, prior episodes. It's going to be It's going to be You've laughed before my jokes. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> our guest is about to get yes, up and please, leave with please, this spander. Please. So I'd like to introduce everyone to Jeff Newman. Uh, Jeff is a local, I guess we would say now, uh, but a F- Floridian nonetheless. And Jeff is in the insurance industry, and he's going to kind of take this podcast on a little bit of a different topic than we normally go. But uh, Jeff, kind of, if you can, introduce yourself, tell the listeners your background, and kind of set the stage for what you're here to talk about. You got it. Well, uh, Dr. Rick, Dr. Danny, thank you for having me. Of course. <laughs> Our really happy to discuss all the ways that we're helping protect and enrich the lives of families that received a terrifying diagnosis and are thriving today. And it's mostly due to the fantastic work of practitioners like yourselves. But uh, we know we hit different milestones in life. Some are great and foreseeable, growing business, growing family. Some are unforeseeable and terrifying. We do our best to educate our clients and their advisors on what they own so they have comfort that as things change, their policy has flexibility to change with it. Uh, Because this stuff can be really confusing. I mean, I don't know anything that comes in a 50-page contract that uh, the first time you would ever read it, you understand it completely. So now a lot of people don't have confidence in the planning that they're implementing. So we do the best we can to really educate first And then we get to tell a great story at the end. I mean, decades ago, almost any cancer diagnosis was going to be a tragic outcome. Now, you guys know better than anyone, that's not the case at all. Insurance underwriters and the doctors on their staffs have done a remarkable job in staying in lockstep with all the advances that you guys have uh, put forth uh, every day. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like sometimes when I certainly in over way in over my head on a lot of that stuff. And I also feel like sometimes with contracts, it's like the iTunes agreements, you know, yeah, 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 hundreds of pages, sure, why not, sure, why not. So, yeah, I think getting some insight into that and kind of what, you know, different options patients or patients' family members have, I think would be something really good to learn more about. Right. But yeah. what's your background, Jeff? Tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your – give us your credentials, if you will. My credentials as a native Miamian that has made his mm-hmm. way up to Jacksonville – about eight years ago because I met a beautiful woman that was far smarter than I was and said she'd rather raise children in North Florida than South Florida. So here we are. And uh, we're we're happily uh, living in Atlantic Beach. Uh, I've been a capital markets guy, it seems like forever. I used to run a team at Deutsche Bank and uh, sadly the bank wasn't doing very well. So I started looking around for other options. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine runs a fantastic insurance practice in Miami and said, listen, you know, the office is in West Palm and the next closest one is in Atlanta. Uh, your little uh, neck of the woods is grown up enough that we need to start having boots on the ground and representation in North Florida. Uh, so here I am uh, representing Tampa, Orlando, but mostly Jacksonville and Ponte Vedra. Um, but you know, now it's it's your fun. I mean, the the stuff that you guys are doing, uh, we learned a lot about in COVID. Of mm-hmm. listen, what are you going to do? You gonna stop business entirely? We don't really know. We don't have statistics. We're, we're yeah. you know going it's as blind. exactly, <clears throat> and we thought, well, uh, older people will have stricter guidelines. Uh, comorbidities will have stricter guidelines, but everybody else, underwrite, get get going. And these are the people putting their money behind it to the tune of billions of dollars every single day. 
And so that's where we kind of get into the difference between clinical medicine and insurance medicine. Clinical medicine, you reserve the right to change your opinion as the facts change. You're going to continue to monitor for months and years on end. In insurance medicine, we are taking a snapshot today and we got to put our money where our mouth is. And once the policy is in force, it really doesn't matter what else we find. We're aligned at that point. And so we, we see a lot of things where we're doing the best we can with the data we have. Uh, the old saying, uh, in God we trust, all others must bring data. So that's, that's a mm-hmm. lot where we stand on uh, some data from the American Cancer Society on percentage of new cases versus percentage of deaths. Mm-hmm. And when we see one of your patients come through to remission, now we have a little bit of data on, okay, a breast cancer case comes through to remission, about two years after that, they can apply for life insurance. And according to everything that you guys have done, probably get a standard rating. This isn't going to be some cost prohibitive, sure, we'll give you something, but you're going to pay as much in premium as you're going to get in death benefit on the other side. You're going to be written as a standard individual, most GI. Same thing, two to three years. Lung cancer. Lung cancer is a big killer. We're looking at uh, new cases in men and women are about 12 to 13% lung, and they're killing about 22% of the people that die from cancer every year. We are still underwriting about three years after remission in lung cancer patients. Mm -hmm. These are standard issue, not a crazy premium situation. Do you you have any data or insight, I guess, into what percentage of cancer survivors actually apply for life insurance and or family members apply for life insurance once they see someone close to them go through something like that. You know, I think it's something Mm -hmm. that I'll I'll be honest, I personally don't bring up to patients um, or, you know, but it's certainly something I think I should get into more about, Mm -hmm. but what um, do you, you, number one, do you have any idea of those statistics or generally speaking? And then I guess number two is, you know, we have a lot of listeners that are patients or family members of patients. How would you advise them to kind of approach if they're the patient or if they're the family member or both kind of how should they think about these things um, life insurance wise, you know, what, what would you advise them to do? So we'll put the patient aside for a second. Now, whether it is a diagnosis, um, you know, that's cancer related or it is a scary, uh, almost crazy car accident on JTB, when somebody has a scare like that, There's some protection and some planning you've been meaning to do, but life gets in the way. I got summer camp with the kids. I'm juggling a podcast in my own practice. I'm doing all these things. (laughs) And then something scary happens or something scary happens to somebody in your family and you have that impetus of urgency. Mm -hmm. I've been meaning to do this for a while. Let's get this done. So oftentimes when we talk about, you know, putting the patient aside for a second, all the other family members that are saying, I've been meaning to do this, or I got a little policy in place right after I got out of college and had my first child, but I haven't looked at it in 15 or 20 years. I don't really know what I own or what's appropriate for me. So we, we get that urgency from, you know, someone else in the family getting it. What we talk about a lot is we've never delivered a death claim that someone said, what kind of insurance did mom or dad have? They all just look at the number and say, oh my goodness, you know, Sure, there shouldn't be another zero at the end of this. Sorry, <laughs> bad insurance joke. Um, but they, they, that's the first thing that we talk about is you're kind of guaranteeing your insurability when you're younger and healthier. Mm-hmm. People talk about term policies that you're just renting a death benefit. You're throwing money out the window. If you don't die, you know nothing happened, and this is just how the insurance company gets rich. We sell a lot of convertible term policies with a lot of flexibility embedded into it. Because if you get something in place for, call it 10 to 20 times what your current salary is, it might sound like a lot of money. Deduct what your outstanding liabilities are for your home, future education costs, the burn rate of the family for about two or three years if someone's out and grieving and just kind of sorting themselves out. All of a sudden, throw some inflation on top of that and it doesn't sound like that much money anymore. You get something in place to guarantee your insurability. Then if you get a diagnosis sometime down the road or there is some other accident or issue in the family, all of a sudden you can convert that to some sort of permanent policy as the cash flow and situation in your family arises. So we talk about as a baseline for everybody, uh, family members that are listening, um, you know, we know that the patient is going to have to achieve remission first, and then there's going to be a little bit of a waiting period after that to make sure that nothing comes back. Then they could get written appropriately. Just because you have a family history 
of cancer or family history of any other disease, that is not going to count against you. You can absolutely get a preferred and top rating just because somebody else in your family's gotten a diagnosis. What do you think is the main driver behind people waiting to get life insurance policy or you know, even even to meet with somebody like you to talk about what their options are? Is it that they don't think about it, like you said, until some life event happens? Or is it because lack of education or um, scared about the amount of money they're paying every month for a policy? What do you think is kind of the driver behind that? So sadly, the barrier to entry in my industry is very low. And so if somebody puts money towards Mm -hmm. a complicated contract that they don't fully understand and the agent hasn't explained very well, Mm then all of a sudden there's no confidence in the planning they're putting forward. Now, as you speak about it to your neighbor or your buddy at the golf club or whatever else, someone at work, you don't really articulate very well what you just purchased. And they're like, man, it sounds like you're throwing money away. Right. And when you try to speak about it further and, well, it's a tax-free investment. And, you know, once you exceed your Roth limits, there aren't a lot of ways that you can grow money tax-free. And I really think this is a special thing that I can do. I'd love to introduce you to my agent. He can explain it to you because I don't understand. That really falls through. I mean, I don't care what product you're selling or what service you're offering. Mm -hmm. If you need to go back to that person to have it explained properly. Mm -hmm. And this stuff is, is tough. I mean, I'm a parent myself. If I go to my pediatrician about something that is happening with my son, I want to have my wife on speakerphone because my ability to take in the information and then articulate it to her, Mm -hmm. I fall down on the job and I care a lot about my son. (laughs) So to to expect that's good to hear at least. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) To expect someone to understand this right off the bat with all the different intricacies to it. It really, there's a lot of work to be done in my industry. And that's why a lot of people are saying, I don't know what I own. I don't know anyone else that is wealthy, that I respect financially, that seems to be getting wealthy doing this. So, you know, I'm not really sure about this. Maybe I'll just pass on it for now until some crazy event happens. And then all of a sudden they're like, yeah, I need to revisit my planning. I'm not sure I'm I'm properly protected. I think, and this is true of a lot of the financial industry, I think First of all, I think in this country we don't do a good job at the primary level in high school and be, you know, really educating people on just the basics of finance. I think is one mm-hmm. to, to your point, and two is I think especially now that the internet has kind of flattened some of the information asymmetry that I think used to be present. You know, like as a consumer, you not understanding things. Some of that's gotten a little bit better because people now right. can can do their own homework online. I think a lot of it has to do with sometimes it's obviously people, especially when it comes to life insurance, don't want to think about that stuff, right? I mean, especially when you're younger, the last thing you're worried about in your 20s or 30s is, mm-hmm. well, I'm not going to talk about dying. I don't, you know, that's for future me to worry about decades from now. So I think there's some inertia there of people not wanting to confront the reality that we're all eventually going to die, as morbid as that sounds, but I think that's part of it. Mm-hmm. And then I think the other part of it, as, as Jeff was kind of alluding to, is when there's a lot of opaqueness in a product, right? When like mm-hmm. someone's explaining you to something and they get through four or five sentences and you're, you're, you're already kind of nodding off. You know, I think a lot of people, and I'm, I'm the same way, you wouldn't trust that because just because you don't understand necessarily the intricacies of it. Right. And I think there's definitely a predatory component of it um, as well that's out there in some, in some cases. So to me, it's like this, like this, like bubble of like all these right. little different things that people just say, "Ah, eh, the heck with it. I don't want to deal with it." At least that's how well, I view it. I don't know. It's kind of like who do I meet with, too, right? Because you get recommendations from friends. You know, I know Jeff. He's great. Go meet with him. Or you look online. You search for the top ten best, you know, financial planners or insurance planners. So it, you don't know where to look. You, you know, you probably listen to a friend who has a good experience or a family member, but. Um, online, you know, other resources. Uh, there's so many options that who who can I go to that I would trust who's not going to just take my money and um, and not give me a good plan. And there are a lot of, you know, details in those contracts which make people nervous, I'm sure, about, you know, putting their money every month into certain plans. Um, but how do you, I guess, relieve some of that tension and nerves that come with, you know, people... Uh, putting their money into different plans and getting set up for the future Um, because it is an investment it depends on you know how broad you want to make your 
um, you know, life insurance and other kind of umbrella plans? And how do you kind of guide people, you know, say with, uh, you know, people with middle class incomes and people who are on the wealthier side? Right. And it's the same as when they, the first time you see a new patient, we diagnose what they have right. and we get them to explain kind of in an open-ended manner what they want to do and what they, and how they want to achieve it. We try and give as many options and as much liquidity to these plans as possible because life throws curveballs. I mean, anyone that can track financial markets, track a pandemic, track anything you like about walking out the door and being able to forecast what tomorrow's gonna look like, good luck with that. So mm. we do a great job, you know, we work a lot through advisors. Uh, a lot of trust and estate attorneys say, you know, congratulations, Dr. Rick, Dr. Danny, you're now worth a uh, hundred million dollars from your, you know, podcast fame that uh, Spotify picked up from you. What was that again? We're, yeah, we're like the live golf tour, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, million. we're the dead on arrival golf tour. <laughs> I don't think I don't think we got anywhere. <laughs> well, we'll work nice. on that. I, nice. Yeah, I, pr I appreciate the, uh, <laughs> yeah. the positive feedback, though, Jeff. At at that point a lot of advisors say we can do all we can to move assets out of your estate and into a trust. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, to pass down your podcast assets, <laughs> your real estate and everything else that you Hear own. That, we got three cameras, a couple of lights. <laughs> yeah. Let's retire. Rock and rolling. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we work with in, in getting these advisors to understand what we bring to the table. And they take a big gulp when they look at a premium payment for you know tens of millions of dollars of death benefit that it's going to pay off the irs you know oftentimes if we're at a cocktail party you know what do you do for a living well i sell a lot of insurance to rich people to pay off the irs when they pass that's essentially what it looks like in the wealth transfer space. That's your elevator pitch. That's my elevator pitch. <laughs> then, I, then I go over and I pretend I'm a radiation oncologist. <laughs> I get a free drink at the bar and then I come back. <laughs> um, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my juke. Um, to that end, what, what do the wealthy kind of not think about is right. disability income. That, you know, in your profession, above all else, uh, white collar, 250K and up, um, you're on your feet a lot. You're working with your hands. A lot of, whether it's cancer, whether it's stroke, whether it's heart attack, whether it's neurological it, or car accident or otherwise, a lot of things can take you out of doing your job the way you expect to do it. Could you still go teach? Yeah, but I didn't get to where I am in life to want to go back and teach. I want to do my job as expected to make, you know, Two hundred fifty, five hundred thousand dollars, whatever the case may be, and then have it taken from you, and look at your disability insurance that you might have through a group or through a, a company, and say, "Yep, uh, after taxes, you know, eight, ten thousand dollars a month is not going to cut it to keep the kids in private school and not lose the golf club and be able to keep the mortgage on and go to Publix all in the same month." So these are the things that people don't want to look at because they're complicated. And it takes a professional to work with their advisors and make sure they get comfort around it. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting. Obviously, not everyone's going to be in a position where they have substantial incomes now. Do you, obviously, the what you would recommend to somebody, like you said, you're going to diagnose them when they walk in. For I know you obviously are primarily focused more on, you know, clients who are, you know, on the higher end of the income spectrum. Would you give your thoughts or just like a couple words on what you would recommend if, you know, someone's not either not currently working and not pulling in income or someone who's like, you know, on the, on the lower end of that scales or is what, what kind of differences would you recommend just kind of holistically speaking for people who are listening? Term policies are the cheapest way to get death benefit insurance. And that, you know, insures against the worst case scenario. And you have to have an honest conversation with what is the family's burn rate and, if, you know, your spouse or you're thinking about your children, you know, the old saying, there's two reasons to buy life insurance, someone you love and someone you owe, um, you know, the person you love, w what's it going to take? What would they expect? You're going to have that conversation with your partner and say, I think that we owe, you know, $200,000 on our home and it looks like we spend $5,000 a month. Um, if I get coverage for, you know, Three hundred twenty, three hundred fifty thousand dollars. At least we won't lose the home, and you'll have about two years to grieve before we get to a point where, yeah, you're really gonna have to sell and upend everything if I'm not here anymore. 
And so when you make basic calculations like that on a term policy and you say, well, how many years do I need this term policy to hang around for? Well, how old is your youngest child? Think about that time frame until they're 25 or so and out of the house and on their own and a full-fledged adult. Now you kind of get to a baseline of this is enough to cover a roof over our head and basic needs. And I have it for a time period that will take us to my youngest child getting to an adult. This gives me a baseline. As cash flow increases, then we can talk about different ways that we can grow money for you, make this permanent, pass something down so that you can spend down your retirement assets without that little guilt trip in your ear that I got to leave something to the kids. Uh, all these things are in the future and flexible that you can convert, add on, whatever, but you guarantee your insurability today. You do it at a low enough level that you're comfortable with the cash flow and you don't feel hamstrung by the whole thing. And, and it's a, the beginning of a relationship. Did you get any education, Danny, when you were in training about what to do or no? Financial planning, no. I mean, I think in terms of the insurance side of things, I think when I, I didn't get my life insurance policy until I think the first part of residency. And I just said, at that time, my wife was pregnant with our first child. And I think when you start seeing in med school and, and beyond a lot of deaths and a lot of you know bad situations, you start thinking about, well, now that I have a kid coming, I got to prepare that, you know, if I do die, my wife's not stuck with, you know, working full time and, and worrying about paying the bills. So that's when I took that policy out, but no formal education on it. I think we... We met with our current insurance agent and just talked to them about different policies. So, um, which probably I need to revisit because <laughs> I haven't since then. So I know a guy. Um, you know, <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I don't think we do. I mean, I think the only thing that comes with med school is like toward the end of med school, they're like, you know, when 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 you're ready to pay your debt like these are your options <laughs> you know here's some yeah. companies that you can talk to to pay off your student loans and it's 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 it, it honestly, it's not financial planning it's like this is how to pay your debt you know? it's honestly to me just extremely disappointing and frustrating how right. easily we can accept these loans and these gigantic financial commitments with you know absolutely no education explanation of the implications you're getting yourself into right and then just the lack of knowledge from the institutions and in, in kind of preparing you for some of these things life insurance disability insurance you know how, what's the best way to repeat it pay this loan should you refinance these things mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. should in my opinion be part of you know an education right and it's just it's um just disappointing, I guess, because I mean, how many people do we know who took out loans for school, who are you know making an income where you should be able to you know reasonably pay them off, who mm -hmm. can, or figuring out different things? Or I have so many too too many people that I talk to that have children that don't have life insurance and things like this, and mm -hmm. it's just um, just I, I don't know. I wish there was a better way we could get the message out, um, you know, and it, and it's not. Just for doctors, lawyers, business owners, high income professionals, it's, it's yeah. everyone across the spectrum. You know, if you have someone who is a dependent, you know, you're the parent or the guardian or whatever, and there's a dependent, you need to be thinking about, as Jeff was alluding to, yeah. worst case scenario, what do I need to do to at least allow them to not have additional burden to already having the fact that they're losing a loved one? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think what I've always heard is, Hope for the best, prepare for the worst, right? And so I think that's mm -hmm. kind of the, I don't know, I just, philosophically, it's just very frustrating, I guess, how mm -hmm. there's such a lack yeah. of, of that. No one ever talks about it because it's no one wants to talk about bad stuff. Yeah, it's lack of preparation because, you know, a lot of us aren't prepared for, you know, the worst that could happen to us and, and the family. I mean, primarily, and once you have young kids here and you think about, you know, God forbid I or my wife dies and, you know, what would life look like and would we be financially okay? You know, I think we're fortunately in a profession where, um, you know, we, we have, a lot of us have loans, but a lot of us can pay them back and, you know, it takes time. And, but even with, um, you know, the way, the way things are set up now for, for physicians, you know, there are physicians that are struggling you know, sometimes to pay back large loan amounts and, 
um, might might think of insurance policies as being another another burden depending on um, their financial situation. So I think there are situations even for high income earners that um, people are a little nervous to to pay extra money into these policies and setting themselves up. Yeah, I mean it's. I don't know. This may be a bad analogy, and Jeff may roll his eyes. But like the way I always view it is, like it's like a sports analogy. It's yeah. offense defense, right? Right. You need to have a good offense, but you also need to have a good defense as well, or at least make sure that you're right. You know, one's not you know exceeding the other. You know, if you're gonna whatever your income level is, if you're spending way more than you make, then guess what? That's mm-hmm. that you're that's not going to be sustainable. Um, so it's just I don't know. It's just in this just. I don't know. I feel like in general, we just do a really, 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 really poor job of educating people on financial literacy. So we've so, seen a couple. So, sorry, sorry so we're getting off the off guard. No, so, so we've seen a couple instances of that, and it's yeah. not exactly the medical profession. It's um, a Bloomberg article and a CNBC article uh, tabbing Henry's high earner, not rich yet, and it's huh. two hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars <laughs> and above. Thirty six percent are living paycheck to paycheck where if they were to miss a paycheck for any reason, they would be going into some kind of debt to fund their life. Mm -hmm. This isn't at the bottom end, and we have a lot of trouble in America at the bottom end. I'm saying at 250 and above living paycheck to paycheck, to your point about loans, to your point about financial security, what's an appropriate burn rate, what is just an emergency slush fund that, you know, call it under the couch money for a bad day, I don't know. But that sort of, you know, financial irresponsibility is prevalent. Mm-hmm. So to throw on top of that, you know, Jeff, I'm just kind of getting by month to month. You're asking me to throw on, you know, a couple hundred bucks in a premium. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure now's the right time. Right. Um, to that, there's a bit of miseducation on investments as well. Um, a lot of people think that maxing out their 401k or maxing out a SEP IRA is the best thing they can do for themselves. Because they say, look, Jeff, I, I made 250000 I put 56 k away in a SEP IRA, and now I show that you know, I only made uh, you know, 194000 to the government. I paid less in taxes. Sure. Future you is going to cash that check, and mm-hmm. you're going to pay you know, probably an elevated tax rate. Whatever the rate versus, is. Versus, right. Do you think the tax rate is going to be higher or lower? I mean, you're just a ticking time bomb that you <laughs> pushed out to the future. Is it appropriate to save? Yes. If you get a match from your employer, get that above all else. I mean, just really, if your employer uh, matches 3%, 5%, wherever the case may be, eat ramen noodles a couple you know, times a month to make sure that you can achieve that free money. After that, if you're making less than 144000 or 214 as a married couple, the Roth IRA is your best friend because you get to grow all that tax-free. Once you get past that, then I can show you some compelling options that say, I'm better than your IRA. I'm better than the unmatched portion of your 401k. Oh, that's within an insurance policy? Yes, it is. Why didn't my financial advisor tell me about this? Because the laws just changed last year. I'm not trying to go toe-to-toe with your financial advisor. I'm saying that in concert with the rest of your portfolio, I might have a piece. So I think that's something, I mean, even I'm naive to that thought, but, you know, a lot of people, as Rick said, don't have the education. Well, I think it really comes down to what's your comfort level in figuring this stuff out for yourself. Yeah. Like, I tend to be on the nerdier type and mm-hmm. go way too deep down rabbit holes and get way too involved with this stuff. Right. But a lot of people don't want to have that level of, you know, they don't want either they don't want the responsibility because they're worried obviously if something goes wrong then they have no one else to point their finger at and so i think in those cases especially in folks who very busy career you know those type of and they don't want to even think about this stuff Mm -hmm. i think products where you can balance downside risk with some upside you know i think it it could make sense for the right individual but i think that's part of I, i liked what you said about someone comes into your office and you diagnose them. I think that's really the most important thing because mm-hmm. everyone's going to be different. And so I think it's a, like we always talk about here mm-hmm. when we talk about treating cancer patients, it's you're not treating necessarily just based on a book, you're treating the individual in front of you. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's, you know, from a financial standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. Um, a couple of things to tutor on horn to what you guys have been doing, the um, 
what's your opinion of the epigenetic testing and, and being able to catch some things for people that aren't really going to see their doctor as regularly since COVID and everything else that we're seeing a lot of numbers that testing is down and it doesn't mean that, you know, cancer is down. It just means that people aren't finding out about it as early as they normally would by missing a checkup here and there. I mean, I certainly think you saw that during COVID where, you know, you, you had a lot of patients, uh, not a lot, but I don't want to make it seem like it's a majority, but we definitely had a, a good number of of people who waited to be seen for a urgent medical matter, you know, whether that be, you know, bleeding or uh, something that ultimately led to a cancer diagnosis. Um, but, you know, maybe the pandemic scared them a little bit to get in with their physician or, you know, had some, some other thing that led them to not, not go seek medical care right away. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, now it's gotten to be in terms of patient follow up and and people actually getting seeking care when they need to a little bit better. Um, and by epigenetic, what do you mean by that? Uh, the Galeri. I want to make sure I'm pronouncing it rest correctly. The Galeri test, the Grail. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think. Go, go ahead. ahead. I was gonna say I think. Well, let's get another <laughs> can of worms. But it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, obviously a lot of like. Jeff said people stopped going to their doctor, right. weren't doing preventative care, routine mm-hmm. stuff that we know has benefit, like getting your blood pressure checked, you know, <laughs> yeah. checking your cholesterol at certain intervals, things like that. Yeah. And so I think a lot of hope, like, has been placed on some of these tests, but either genetic tests or epigenetic tests, like you mentioned, or things like colon cancer screening with Cologar that you can do at home. Right. And I think, unfortunately, when you really dig into the weeds of the data mm-hmm. when you really parse a lot of this out it ends up being kind of nonsense for lack of a better word and i know that may be controversial i mean even when you parse into the data of mammogram the evidence for doing mammograms mm-hmm. and psa obviously is one everyone knows about you know you can make a lot of these arguments that even as aggressive as we screen things now may or may not be you know clinically meaningful to the population as a whole so I guess what I would say is for my practice or how I would educate somebody, I would not view that anywhere close to being a substitute for, you know, seeing your actual physician for routine care. And I don't, you know, from your perspective, I would not think the data is there that I would use that to guide either positively or negatively, you know, what level you would of risk you would categorize an individual at. I don't but, know if you feel differently. No, and I think that kind of cancer screening, you know, doing blood tests, searching for, you know, cancer DNA um, and having it kind of ubiquitous, searching for all cancer types. Um, I I think the data is not quite there yet to even, you know, introduce that into our practice. I don't I don't really know anyone that's doing that yet because you have um, sensitivity at actually picking up on cancers at different stages, which are widely different, you know, depending on what the stage of the cancer is. Um, I think it's a little bit better at picking up on late stage cancer, which is understandable. Um, but you, you, if you have, and I don't have the percentages off the top of my head, but if you have a, a sensitivity of 40, 50% for an early stage cancer, you're missing half of that. And so right. why do you even do the test in the first place? Right. Now, if you have a positive result, sure, but you're, you're also spending a lot of money to have a test like that. Yeah, I think it's just a... Unfortunately, patients get built out of these sure. tests that are not cheap. And, right. And right. whether or not it actually does anything that – I always say if you're going to order a test, yeah, is the result going to change your management? And right. if the answer is no, why are we doing some of these things? But, right. again, and I – To the point on cost was why it was so interesting to me mm-hmm. because at a certain level, and it depends on the insurance carrier, they're purchasing them for free. And if we say – Okay, uh, Doctor Rick, uh, you have a five million dollar policy with uh, you know X Y Z carrier. Uh, would you like this eleven hundred dollar test for free? And you say, all right, sure. So these are the insurance companies. Yeah, they're saying that once you're already a policy in force, 
we are as aligned as anyone for you yeah, to make it course. as right. long right. as possible. I mean, outside of your wife and children, yeah, there's no, nobody that right. wants so, you to I make mean, it. In that case, if someone's if they are encouraging the tests, right. I mean, but I'll... to your point, they do everything statistically related. Correct. And if the data isn't there yet, but they're willing to shell out, you know, eleven hundred dollars per right. patient that they're buying, it's interesting to me. And I just wanted your opinion on that. Yeah, that, you yeah. Know, it's, well, it's you a, also got to remember. I mean, I don't know. If you can tell me, or maybe I don't know what what's who what companies are your predominant that you deal with insurers like who are they specifically? Are we talking like the traditional insurance? Yeah, I mean, John think? Hancock, Prudential, Pacific Life, uh, Nationwide, and then the reinsurers behind them are generally uh, Munich and uh, and Swiss RE, and they're just looking at their high end liabilities and say, you know, listen, uh, we don't see. You know, he's 50 years old and he's, you know, got a big enough policy with us. Send him a test if he's willing to. Right. Well, yeah, I think I think you. there's probably, I'm sure, a stratification they say right. where, okay, this guy's policy. We need to really keep this guy going keep as around, long as we yeah. can. So I'm sure when they crunch those numbers, the math right. well, changes. They don't, they don't need to find that many positive results where it's like, oh, my goodness. Right. Good thing we caught this. But to your point, right. if right. it doesn't really catch much of anything until you're at a later stage anyways, right. then what yeah. have you really done? Right. right. And I, well, I just – I think it – I bet if you apply that to all policyholders or across yeah. the population, Falls you're never going to get through a return on investment. Right. But in a one where one Small of them, cohort, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, then yeah. that's probably how they have run the numbers and justified. If we get X number of people positive, mm-hmm. this is the policies that these X number of people have. Where's the math shake out to how many we need right. to test? I mean, it's it's all a number, a math problem at the end of the day. <laughs> the difference between clinical medicine and insurance medicine, we brought up quickly. What can you as physicians do that is completely appropriate from your point of view, but helps your patient? Things like no more scans are needed, appears benign. We do not anticipate it changing. This no longer needs further follow-up. No more CT scans or specialty specialty tests needed. Any of these comments in an APS gives an underwriter a large degree of confidence. Now, you know you're still going to see that person in six months from now. A year from now, how, how often do you generally monitor after you achieve remission? I mean, yeah, depends they're, on the they're going to yeah, be around. It's right, not yeah. like this is goodbye. Five plus. Right. <laughs> so to put something like that, you have not actually done anything incorrect but it gives a lot of confidence to an underwriter that they're not going to have to come back and get another note and another letter from their oncologist, you know, giving more descriptive uh, answers about where they're at. So yeah. those sort of statements are something that you should kind of take to heart and say, mm-hmm. if we really are that confident that they're walking out of our building and we're very proud of our result, uh, those statements are very, very helpful to underwriters. Yeah, it makes sense. I guess the challenging part in that and a lot of cancers is, you know, usually there's at least five years Mm-hmm. minimum radiographic kind of surveillance for mm-hmm. a lot of cancer, not all, but a lot of cancers. And, you know, it's tough to, you know, you want to say the scans have looked great for three years. There's certainly, I can write, you know, no evidence of cancer at this moment, but, you know, mm-hmm. saying we don't need to do any more scans ever is, you know, sometimes can be a tough putt. Mm-hmm. But I wonder if there's a way to. No, you don't, no, you don't need to say no more scans ever. So we talk about this a lot in the sense of, um, one of the questions that uh, insurance carriers ask when you're about to get underwritten is, do you have any upcoming or plans to take any international travel? Hmm. Now, a lot of people speculate. I don't know. I mean, might go, you know, might go to the British Open, might uh, go take the family to the Bahamas. I, I can't tell you, you know, my entire future. I'd, right. The question is, do you have plane tickets purchased today for international travel? Anything else is speculation right right to your point about the APS as I look at this patient today appears benign right anything else is speculation and you reserve the right to change your answer as things change sure. but that's where we take the difference between clinical medicine and a snapshot in time for insurance medicine yeah yeah so using what what we're seeing at that moment when we're seeing the patient reviewing the CT scan on exam, no evidence of cancer, yeah. CT scan, no evidence of cancer. Yeah. You're going to look at that and say cancer's I mean, free. My follow-up yeah. is usually what I'll document. Right. is like so-and-so, you know, looked at their scans, examined them. Right. You know, at this time, he has no radiographic or clinical evidence of cancer recurrence, discuss the need for continued follow-up surveillance, right. whatever. But, yeah. Right. So hopefully that's 
That works, works well. That's great. Yeah. It's just that uh, you know a lot of other physicians that are <laughs> not so verbose in those, and mm. they just leave it very open-ended. Right. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. in your mind, I'm scheduling this person to come back in six months to a year anyways. Yeah. Why do I need to put anything more in the APS? Right. right. But it's helpful to them as you discuss it, I, future you know, planning. CT reviewed, you don't get too much more information. Right. You're like, oh, okay. What, what did right. it look Good, like? bad, upside down? Right. Lymph nodes benign? What? Right. right. And then we're calling over to your office and it's like, really? What, yeah. what do I need? I have to right. fax something? Right. What, right. what no, century are we in? You're right. There's a, a big variance of what you're going to get. Yeah. Documentation is unfortunately half yeah. of our lives. Yeah, I have not seen a consult for a positive test yet, but that okay. that's going to be interesting if one rolls rolls yeah. around here and says, "Oh, my insurance uh, sent me this test." And can it's you not available this? in Florida yet. I, yeah. I think it's like so, state by state. They have state to. By state, yeah. So it's going to take a while to roll out. But it was just it's interesting. You know, new. Yeah. You know, as I was researching for this podcast, sure. I came across that and uh, you know uh, a dad joke or two. So. I, oh. I just made sure I was prepared for today. Yeah. Well, speaking of. Well, speaking of, you, ha- you have to. Uh, <laughs> now you have to lay, lay the dad joke on us before well, we get going. Well, doctors, what is the difference between a snowman and a snowwoman? You're physicians. I, I didn't get my snowman degree, though. I don't know. Snowballs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was oh, wow. Love it. That was, that's an A. That's there an A joke. Go. There you go. It's not going to get better than that. No, <laughs> it doesn't here. No, that's that's as good as it gets right yeah. there. That'd be sorry. Fun. I'll give you props. <laughs> Thanks everyone for listening to another episode of the Rick and Danny Show. We hope you enjoyed this little detour and special treat. I'd like to thank our guests, Jeff. Thank you so much for taking the time. Come educate us. Certainly, this was an area I didn't have much you know knowledge in, and I think it's been helpful to me and hopefully helpful to our listeners as well. Yeah, I agree, Rick. Thanks so much, Jeff. I think we learned a lot this episode and our patients. Happy to be here. Uh, if anyone is listening and wants to know more, Jeff Newman at uh, Jones Lowry. You can find me uh, LinkedIn, Google. You'll I think me. Brenna, I'll you link can, it in the show Yeah, notes. we'll make sure to put it in the show notes as well. Perfect. And as always, follow us on social media. Uh, follow us on Twitter, Rick Danny Show, uh, Facebook and Instagram, Rick and Danny Show, and Email us at rickanddannyshow at gmail.com. Until next time, thanks for listening. Thanks, guys.